Ladies and gentlemen, welcome the moderator of the last session, Alena Kutsko. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for staying with us. Uh, I know this is the uh, last session before the concluding remarks on the agenda, and this is titled Future of Democracy of the, in the Post-COVID World. Although it is the last session, I would not say that this is the last topic that we're discussing because the issue of democracy was actually the topic that we discussed from the very first session and that was probably the most recurrent theme throughout the whole conference. President of the Slovak Republic, Zuzana Chaputova, opened the entire forum by talking about the issues of democracy that we are facing at home and abroad. Uh, during, we had multiple discussions. Last night we awarded two awards to one to Karl Schwarzenberg and another one to Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya. Both, both awards were in recognition of the individual's contributions to the fight for democracy, decency and human rights. So signing up the entire forum, we're going to dive in deep into the issues of democracy with a very fantastic lineup of speakers. So with us today are uh, Vera Jurova, who is the Vice President for Values and Transparency at the European Commission, joining us from Brussels. Welcome. Thank uh, you and good afternoon. Uh, Honorary Madeleine Albright, former U.S. Secretary of State, joining us from Washington, D.C. Thank you. Uh, Christopher Walker, who is Vice President mm -hmm. at the National mm -hmm. Endowment for Democracy, also joining us from Washington, D.C. Thank you. Uh, uh, Markus Reinisch, who is Vice President for Public Policy in Europe, the Middle East and Africa joy, uh, at Facebook, joining us from London. That's right. Thank you for having me. And uh, Ivan Krastev, who is the Chairman of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia, but actually joining us from Vienna. Thank you. And I will go first to um, Secretary Albright. Of course, democracy is always work in progress. But for many, COVID-19 has, in a way, cemented the perception that democracies around the world are disintegrating and facing a lot of external and internal challenges. Could you explain to us your vision? Do you think uh, that the current crisis, whether it's the perceived crisis or real crisis, is significantly worse and fundamentally different from those that democracies went through in the past? And if so, what are the core challenges that distinguish the current crisis? Well, I do think we are in a very uh, difficult time as far as governance generally is concerned. Some of it has to do with, uh, I've been talking about mega trends in some ways, that uh, globalization is the major one, and it is one from which we have all benefited, but it also has a downside because it in fact is faceless and people want to know what their identities are. And uh, if my identity hates your identity, it leads to nationalism and hyper-nationalism is very dangerous. That's one megatrend. The other is technology, which has clearly been a great advantage in many ways. And I always love to talk about the Kenyan woman farmer who doesn't have to walk miles anymore to pay her bills. She can do it over a mobile phone. But there is a downside in that it has disaggregated voices and people don't know where they're getting their information and what are the motivating factors. But I think the real problem here is that we don't recognize the fact that the major threats to us know no borders. Uh, the virus knows no borders uh, and it affects huge numbers of population. I would like to point out though that the countries that are actually uh, in a position to control and have done a pretty good job are frankly, democracies that, it is not a coincidence, are run by women. You know, whether it's New Zealand or Taiwan uh, or Germany, um, Finland, uh, Norway, and I Iceland. And I think that part of it has to do with understanding the needs of the people, of getting them to be a part of the solution and not being told what to do, but to understand the importance of active participation and that democracy is not a spectator sport. It is something that the population has to work on, uh, contribute to, but it is, I believe, the way 
people everywhere want to live because we want to be able to make decisions about our own lives. And so uh, democracy is fragile, but it is also resilient. And I hope we spend more time kind of looking at the characteristics that make democracy a chosen way for people to live rather than to be uh, run by authoritarians and dictators. Thank you so much, State Secretary. I'm sure we're going to deep into the characteristic, but also into the ways how we can preserve this characteristic uh, and make our democracies even more resilient. I'll go now to Vice President Yorova. Uh, you're representing um, an organization that was set up uh, in a way that uh, was supposed to enable the functioning of democracy throughout the structures, but also during its accession process. Yet the very nature of your portfolio suggests that we're experiencing a lot of challenges. Uh, the, some of the challenges are the ones that we thought were already addressed long time ago. This is rule of law or freedom of media or judicial independence, or these are the challenges that also Secretary Albright uh, highlighted in her intervention of some of the mega trends, including the challenge of technology. What are your biggest concern from the, your position in Brussels? Yeah, thank you very much once again for inviting me. Uh, well, uh, as, a, as a Czech citizen uh, who remembers uh, authoritarian regime in practice, uh, I have to say that for me, the European Union has always been as a, something uh, which guarantees uh, that these times will not come back. <clears throat> and uh, that it's not only a single market or that that we are not as, as a country in the EU because of the uh, EU funds and, and some, some other benefits. So uh, it's a, a maybe paradox or maybe a symbol that I am now in the position of the first ever commissioner whose uh, portfolio is about values, uh, democracy, rule of law, fundamental rights. I am I am honored uh, to uh, to do this job. What what worries me? I think that uh, it is that uh, there is a lack of uh, care for for democracy. That uh, after after some times of believing that uh, this is the end of the history and that democracy will be automatic and forever, we uh, lost vigilance and we we stopped caring. Who cares for democracy? Politicians, yes, some maybe not, for some it is burdensome even. Uh, the digital giants, we will hear it from from uh, Mr. Reinisch, but uh, I would say, uh, are, aren't they too big to care? Uh, and many people are disillusioned. According to our surveys, we see that in, in many member states in the EU, and it's not only about the East or Central European countries, in mem many member states we see between 30 to 40 percent of people who uh, stop belie to believe that democracy delivers and, and works for them. So we, uh, uh, this is my concern that we uh, stopped uh, active defense and active uh, promotion of, of, of democracy. I, I will quote Václav Havel if you uh, let me do that. Uh, who would, by the way, celebrated his birthday this week. Uh, and it's timely to quote him. Uh, the natural disadvantage of this democracy is that it is extremely tiring to those who mean it honestly, while it allows almost everything to those who do not take it seriously. So uh, we, we have a plenty of, of uh, factors uh, which work even against democracy. Madam Secretary spoke about the advantages which stem from digital revolution and also, also the risks. So we have a lot of uh, digital problems. Uh, that's the interference in elections. It's the online targeting and harvesting of data for political profiling. Um, we see the uh, the rise of, of hatred, which, which has uh, the, the, the green light in, in many, many systems uh, and which uh, uh, might uh, move to, to real life and, and real world. So a, a lot of problems. And in Europe, we think that it's high time we come with some meaningful rules for, for the digital world. Uh, and it's also part of my portfolio that I am now focusing on the, the issue of disinformation especially in relation of, of protection of, of uh, uh, elections. 
and not to be negative about digital uh, digital revolution and digital achievements uh, uh madam madam uh, secretary albright uh, wrote in her uh, in her book uh, fascism uh, that uh, now uh, we can use millions of amplions. So I would say, and I would uh, call on all the Democrats and, and people who have good intentions uh, to use these millions of amplions for, for, for the good of the people. And uh, speaking about the, the rules, so we are going to, to uh, come with at the end of the year. I, I don't want to speak too, too long, but we want to increase the responsibility of the platforms. Uh, we want to introduce the flaw to the digital sphere. We want to introduce there the principle of, of crime and punishment. So illegal content should, should be removed and the perpetrators should, should uh, be uh, somehow um, uh, sh should be punished by, by the law enforcement bodies in, in the European member states. Last comment, uh, we have to make sure that by digital transformation, we are not in the gap in the society. Already now we see some part of the society, the people which already were disadvantaged before COVID, uh, that th this part of the society might be excluded and it would be a, a fatal mistake uh, which we, we must not allow to happen. Uh, so digital divide is something we have to stop or, or decrease, uh, but also we have to pay attention to new technologies such as uh, artificial intelligence that uh, uh, it will be uh, truly human-centric, that we will not uh, copy-paste the the bad things uh, like like uh, racism and and, dis uh, and, and uh, discrimination to, to the, the AI world because again it would be a fatal mistake which would turn first against some part of the society and at the end against, against all of us. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Madam Vice President, also for reminding us that we've been taking a vacation from fighting for democracy for probably a bit way too long, and it's time to get back to work. And once we're on the digital scheme, um, I feel like going to Marcus next uh, for his response about the, how the, what is the role of the social platforms in this fight for democracy, and how do we make sure that the people with good intentions have the opportunity to uh, convert their good intentions into good actions, and people with bad intentions do not get one. Right. Well, thank you, Alena, for having me. Um, look, this is a discussion that is very much shaped by, by COVID and the global pandemic. And this is actually the first global pandemic that is happening in the internet era. And therefore, it's absolutely right that we talk about the roles and responsibilities of companies like Facebook. And it's not just the responsibilities towards its users and towards the businesses we support, but we are at this very, very unique intersection between technology and society. And, um, and I think that really creates this, this, this questions around the impact we have on social cohesion and that we have on the democratic discourse. And Facebook has always been a, a democratizing force. It has put the power in the hands of, of people. Uh, it allows people to organize, to communicate, to agitate, and it also breaks down entry barriers that we still have when it comes to the participation in, in, in the democratic process. But we, we had to learn, I think, the quite hard way that with that role comes a responsibility and a heightened responsibility, and specifically when it comes to the uh, protection of the integrity of elections and when it comes to enabling uh, a really robust debate between people. And we take this very seriously. And, and I don't think that we are too big to care. I think what we do is rather to use the bigness, if you want to say so, and the resources and the technical capabilities we have to really address this head on. And that's the reason why we are we're having 35,000 people that are exclusively um, dealing with the safety and integrity of the platform. You know, we're taking millions of fake accounts off the platform every day. And we tackle misinformation. We, we work with, we have 34 fact-checking partners in Europe who help us to identify misinformation. And misinformation, when we find it, is either removed or it is um, very drastically downgraded so people do not see it anymore. Um, and when it comes to COVID, you know, COVID is a very specific situation, a big challenge for us and for society overall. 
um, and we report on this actually on a very regular basis to Vice President Jourova's office, um, we are taking down hundreds of thousands of items of COVID-related misinformation. And we just reported very recently that we uh, label with a, a misinformation warning, a COVID misinformation warning, between four and five million items of information every month over the last couple of months. But I think when it comes to responsibility, we can't just look at the role that platforms play in reducing harm. I think there's also a role that we play in contributing and in responding to the challenges that COVID has, has created. And, and I think there are a number of challenges. One of them is an economic challenge. And, and I actually believe that a successful and a speedy economic recovery is one of the surest ways to ensure the values of democracy. And here, obviously, we have tools to help businesses to cope with the new situation, to adapt to um, um, and to grow in, in these times. But we're also here to uh, help governments directly to channel authoritative information about how they can help businesses. Um, we have um, a specific economic relief tool where governments can uh, point businesses to government loans, fundings, tax, tax relief, and so on. But there's a there's an information challenge, as we have talked about, and it's misinformation. And, and, and also have a duty to put information uh, in front of people that help them with uh, keeping safe, keeping healthy. And, and here we have um, a COVID information center that has been used by 50 million people, 50 million people getting access through the center to information of local health authorities or to the uh, European Disease Prevention Center. So there's a lot of um, challenges, a lot of roles that we have, responsibilities. And I know that these responsibilities will still be with us even after the virus has gone. And I think that's the reason why we need to understand that there are limitations to what we can do, but it's also the democracies to develop the rules that harness and protect all the good that the internet has brought us, but also at the same time to address the concerns of society. And we are not shying away from this process, you know, and we have many times called for a European framework that brings transparency, accountability and oversight when it comes to election integrity, when elections are fought on online platforms, but also when it comes to the um, are dealing with uh, online, uh, harmful online content. And, and here, I think the European Democracy Action Plan is an extremely important tool and, and we welcome it because it is an opportunity for the European Commission but also for the individual European governments to come together and to lead on developing the clear rules that are so vital for a healthy democracy. I just really worry that if we don't do this, if we don't come together, and if policymakers are not getting in the lead here, then we see something which I would call the acceleration of the Chinese model. And that's a model that is based on a segregated internet, on, based on the state control, the state surveillance. And I just really would like to see a Europe that is not resisting or that, sorry, that is resisting to the urge to actually wall off its citizens from the global internet. And it's rather using its power and muscle to regulate and enshrine European values like openness, transparency, but also individual rights and eventually the encouragement of innovation. Thank you so much, Marcus. And it's not just the first uh, pandemic that is developing in the internet era, but it's also um, a coalescence of the pandemic era and the major elections at the same time. So it's definitely very crucial, as you highlighted, to come together. We'll get back to the European framework um, uh, and the European Democracy Action Plan in a second. But first, uh, you started talking about China and the challenge that China poses to the model of the open internet. So I want to go first to Chris Walker and to Talk to him a little bit about the concept that he writes extensively about, and that is that of sharp power. Uh, Chris, you write a lot about uh, how sharp power influences democratic institutions, especially in media and the sphere of ideas more generally. Could you explain to us how does this type of power manifest itself in today's society, and what is its relation to the democratic recession of the past 15 years? So I'd also like to thank you for the invitation to join this uh, very distinguished group of speakers. I think it's important to point out that we're now 15 years into what Larry Diamond has called the democratic recession. And if you look at this another way, this is half of the period since the Cold War's end that we find ourselves in this situation. And today we're finding ourselves with a multitude of serious cross-cutting challenges to democracy, which 
uh, Secretary Albright, uh, Vice President Yorova alluded to uh, earlier in the discussion. And I think in order to understand what our possible futures are for democracy, it's really important to put into context um, the trajectory of the recent past. Given time limitations, I'm just going to touch briefly on three broad factors that I think are essential. First is the erosion of uh, democracy that's been seen in democracies of all stripes, where institutions are now in need of refurbishing and renewal. This includes strengthening responsiveness to ordinary citizens' needs. It also means ensuring opportunities for shared prosperity at a time when prosperity is not shared uh, nearly enough. At the same time, part of democratic renewal is also a need to fix the glaring vulnerabilities that have emerged in so many domains and that were in, implicit in Mr. Uh, Reinisch's uh, remarks. Uh, these have become so evident in free societies in the last decade and, and a half. And this leads to my second point, which is that coming out of the mid-2000s, we've seen a crucial companion development to the democratic recession, which is the authoritarian resurgence. This has been an unmistakable feature of the global political landscape during this time. Many autocratic regimes have become more repressive around the globe. Uh, and importantly, the leading authoritarians have become far more assertive in their outward projection of influence. This is first and foremost the case with Russia and China, who have devised modern and innovative forms of tyranny, often using emerging technology to advance democracy unfriendly objectives. Uh, the CCP's role in this is particularly important as they're using technology uh, to leverage their um, interests overseas. Barely a day is passing now without a new revelation of the CCP's efforts at political censorship or to influence independent institutions such as universities, think tanks, media, and other sectors in countries with political systems of all kinds. Beijing is also seeking to shape global norms at the UN on a range of issues, including in the technological sphere. They often work in concert with Russia and other authoritarian regimes to reshape these norms in ways that are more friendly to authoritarian practice. I'd stress that this should really be seen as a full spectrum approach to tilting the scales globally towards less democratic and often more corrupt forms of governance. The global pandemic has offered new opportunities for authoritarian regimes to double down on this approach with China in particular seizing on new methods of narrative competition. This brings me to the final piece of this puzzle since the democratic recession has kicked in and that's the digital revolution which my colleagues have touched on. This has gathered steam in the last 15 years YouTube, Facebook, Twitter all came on the scene in the mid 2000s, right around the time the democratic recession kicked in. We've now seen an explosion of misinformation and disinformation that have had the effect of intensifying public distrust in institutions and societies around the world. This is something that hasn't gone unnoticed by authoritarian regimes which are intruding into open systems and the tech platforms within them to an extent that would have been scarcely imaginable during the Cold War. In the absence of steps that can make the digital space more compatible with liberal democracy, distortion will become a feature of the system rather, the, rather than the exception. And I think we're seeing this in many ways today. And I'll just say a word about the challenge that China presents in this regard in the tech sector, since it was mentioned by um, the last speaker. And that is, I don't think the choice is following um, the standards and the norms and the pursuit that China is pursuing. I think this really means that the tech um, innovations and the firms operating in free societies have to raise their own standards in a very meaningful way to ensure that public trust is adhered to and that democratic norms are safeguarded. If we leave it to uh, not reaching the China standards as the only standard, this will simply be inadequate. And I think this is really an opportunity for the leading tech firms in the democracies to step up and fulfill this gaping hole in public trust that we've seen emerge over the last decade and a half. Finally, to your question, Alina, I think what we've seen in this profoundly uncertain context over the last decade and a half is a flourishing of the exertion of what we've called sharp power, which at root centers, censors on censorship and the neutering of independent institutions. And it tends to be accompanied by an authoritarian determination either to monopolize ideas or to suppress alternative narratives. And it's really up to the democracies to uh, ensure that democratic and human rights values are promoted 
so that we don't fall into this um, spiral of uh, norm uh, erosion over time. And one last thought. I think it's so important to note that the inherent value of doc democracy stays with us. We only need to look to a country like Belarus or Sudan or Armenia to see the courage that ordinary citizens are taking to pursue democratic rights in the face of authoritarian uh, practices. And this is something I think, I think that can be used as a refresher for people and democracies who've had the great benefit to live in open societies over these recent years. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, the, you outlined this full spectrum approach both to authoritarianism but also to supporting democracies. And with that, I want to go to Ivan, because on the one hand, we're outlining all the challenges that are in a way accelerating with the development of the COVID-19 and how COVID-19 affects our democratic institutions. But on the other hand, it does not seem like authoritarians are always doing a good job in fighting COVID-19. And as we see, uh, even concerning China, that China has lost some of its reputation in Europe and the United States after the outbreak of pandemic. Ivan, what do you think? Who is having a better crisis, authoritarians or Democrats. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this panel. In the 1970s, the French political scientist Pierre Asner coined a very special term, which was called competitive decadence. So the problem is not who is doing best, better, the problem is who is doing worse. And from this point of view, I very much agree with you. In the beginning of the crisis, particularly in March, in April, when the countries have been closed, when people are closed in uh, their apartments, when the society was very much infected with fear, it was this kind of a common sense that the biggest beneficiary of this crisis are going to be authoritarian regimes on one side and the populist parties within the liberal democracies on the others. And honestly speaking, it didn't happen. And it didn't happen because, uh, contrary to the common expectations, authoritarian leaders does not like crisis like COVID-19. They like crisis that they manufacture themselves. They like crisis that they can control. And the problem with this crisis is that it was overwhelming. This was not just a symbolic game to defeat an enemy. This is very much to solve a problem. And you can see what happened in Brazil this type of a kind of authoritarian democratic uh, system in which Mr. Bolsonaro didn't do it. I do believe Mr. Trump was also going to, his elections are going to be very much affected by the way he responded uh, to the COVID-19 crisis and he might have lost a lot of trust of uh, the American uh, 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 voters. But the classical cases are the classical authoritarian regimes. Look at Mr. Lukashenko. In a certain way, it triggered very much the response to the crisis. People basically in Belarus found themselves in a situation not very different than Chernobyl in 1985. They saw a government that tried to cover the truth in order to have a much more comfortable situation. And, and this is the other kind of an old story about authoritarian regimes that we tend to forget. Authoritarian regimes have the same problem like beauty queens. They fear aging. And this is one thing basically to be in power for 10 years. It is totally different to be in power for 20 years or 26 years. And you saw that the response to COVID-19 was not also particularly effective in places like Russia and other places. So from this point of view, I do believe we should agree that nevertheless that many democracies, and this is particularly painful in the United States, I do believe that symbolically, the dem democracy is going to pay a price for the way the United States dealt with the pandemic and the way basically the United States have been governed for the last four years. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I agree very much with Secretary Albright. Some of the democracies both in Asia and in Europe did well. Uh, concerning populist parties also, there was the huge expectations that they're going to benefit from this crisis because these are the parties which are very masterfully exploiting fear. But it was always my feeling that uh, populists, particularly in Europe, are striving not so much on fear, but on anxiety. And it's different. Anxiety is a diffused fear. You fear everything. You fear that the world is going wrong, that nothing is in the way it's going to be. And as a result of it, you're looking for somebody to represent your anger and your anxiety. But in the moment when the real fear came, when you really fear to be infected, when you fear that you or some of your beloved are going to die, you're looking for a government which is competent and can solve problems. 
And uh, many of these populist uh, leaders were absolutely uh, uh, incapable to do it. So you can see even the results of the last regional elections in Italy to see that contrary to this type of expectations, populist parties are not doing particularly well. So from my point of view, this is why to try to generalize and to see authoritarianism is winning, or to be also on the other side, democracy is winning out of the response to COVID-19, uh, is going to be misleading. Three other factors came up in my view to define better which regimes are going to respond more effectively uh, to, the, uh, to the crisis. The first is the level of social trust. In a crisis like COVID-19, it is very important people to trust their governments because you're not going to send soldiers to see uh, people washing their hands, are they putting masks? And also the strengths basically of the governments to have a unified message and to communicate was critically important. The second thing is effectiveness of the state. It is not by accident that countries like Germany or Denmark or South Korea did well. And the thirdly is also the previous example, uh, a previous experience with crisis like this. This is also not accidental that Asian countries did relatively better than the European countries. For them, this crisis came for the second time in the last 20 years. I'm saying all this because I do believe that it is not enough basically to divide the world simply between democracies and authoritarian regimes. They are democracies that are doing well and that are trying to adjust to this new situation, to the idea of much faster decision making. They are democracies which are not doing particularly well. And on the authoritarian side, I do believe also you can see kind of a China trying to gain out of it, basically uh, uh, trying to use big data in order to consolidate its power. But I don't believe that the last uh, several months has been a great time for authoritarianism. Thank you so much, Ivan, and of course your comparison with the beauty queens uh, inevitably makes me uh, compare the democracies with wine that only gets better with aging. And uh, as we can also see that not all young democracies in the world are doing equally well. But uh, I want to pick up on the things that you started talking about in your factors that contribute to democracies doing well. And I want to go back to uh, Secretary Albright. Uh, Madam Secretary, you uh, wanted also to talk more about the characteristics that are making democracies more resilient. And I definitely count towards these characteristics the women factor that, as you outlined, is contributing significantly to us uh, having a more equal society, but more active and more successful society. Could you please continue? What other factors would you... Uh, what other factors would you uh, outline and characteristics that you would outline that help democracies do better than other regimes? Well, I do think that, and, and by the way, I learned a lot from uh, the colleagues here on the uh, panel. I do think that one of the things that is very important is that democracies have the capability of correcting themselves. That is part of the process in terms of elections, uh, and also, and I have to say from Commissioner Yurova's work in terms of the importance of the rule of law and transparency, those are very important elements and make it possible for democracies to function in very difficult periods. And also, I happen to believe that authoritarian governments, if one looks at them, they don't even trust each other, much less uh, those that they are dealing with. So they have an inherent problem in being rigid uh, and um, not understanding the problems. I also do think that it is very important um, for democratic leaders to understand that they are partners with the people um, and that the social contract is one in which the government um, has, uh, people gave up their individual rights in order to have the government worry about the various issues that affect societies as a whole uh, and are able to provide some uh, way of dealing with those problems and then on the part of the citizens that they have an obligation and a privilege to vote and to be a part of it. So I do think that it is important to look generally at how the rule of law works because it provides a system whereby the people know what is supposed to go on and the governments are supposed to know uh, and in authoritarian systems the rule of law is overthrown. That is one of the first parts. An authoritarian leader does not respect the rule of law. I also do think that it is important in um, uh, this kind of an age where people 
are literate and understand things is to really uh, level with the people themselves and to have some way of looking at what they how they think and i think that um it is important to understand the role of the people and the government that is the most important part i also do think that uh it is essential to understand that we're in a different era um i uh, have talked a lot about technology and i was very glad to hear about the various issues it's, it's a new thing and people uh, don't fully understand its positive and negative aspects, but it is with us and we need to understand how it works, how it operates within the concept of rule of law, how the people themselves use it, uh, and really have the capability of dealing. And so I do think that, um, I, I, again, and I very much admire the work of Commissioner Yurova because in her discussions, she's talked about um, the history of democracy is really a permanent search of the right balance that is limiting the powers of the powerful. And it's a search for the right system of checks and balances so that the citizens have their rights protected and can exercise their sovereign power as freely as possible. And I do think that aspect of checks and balances within a democracy are absolutely essential. Democracy is, uh, this is always a cliche, it is a journey. Uh, it is something that evolves, that the people make better if we really participate in it. Um, and I do think that we need to understand what are the elements that make it work. But I'd like to go back on one thing is to say democracy is fragile, but it is resilient. And democracy has to deliver. I think one of the issues was we were very euphoric about democracy at the end of the Cold War, but it wasn't delivering for everybody. Uh, and I think that we need to think about the social and economic aspects uh, because people want to vote and eat. And so it is important to look at the whole aspect of how democratic governments need to help their people have some economic uh, security, also that they understand the importance of transparency and the rule of law. It's not a simple system. It does require participation. And so I repeat, democracy is not a spectator sport. Thank you so much, um, uh, Madam State Secretary. And uh, I want to go now to uh, Vice President Jurova. And I would like you to pick up uh, on two issues. We've talked a lot about the rule of law. And you mentioned also the rule of law report that's been published recently. And since we're in Central Europe, we had today a session also with the, um, within the V4, where, of course, the issue of the rule of law came up. And we're almost in this uh, Tolstoy situation who said that all the happy families are happy in the same way, but all the unhappy families are unhappy in their own way. And that is what often the, um, at least what we heard today in the discussions, is that the lots of representatives of the countries from the region are saying that all European countries are imperfect, we're just imperfect in our own way. Could you please describe to us how is your work on the rule of law is going, especially in the application with the region, what are potentially the next step? And of course, the second issue, I would like you to briefly respond to Mark about how you are working with the tech giants on the European Democracy Action Plan and, of course, Digital Services Act. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, two, two big questions uh, which require some uh, maybe more precise answers, but I will try to be brief. But first of all, I want to say that Madame Albright has just made my day because she, she appraised my work. And indeed, uh, democracy and work for democracy is never ending. Uh, journey. It's not ticking the boxes. Uh, so I'm happy to, to do this job. Uh, on, on the rule of law, well, uh, we have neglected this uh, this uh, principle in, in the last years. Uh, we have the instruments uh, as the European Commission. We can go after the cases of, of breach of the rule of law in, in different member states. We can use Article 7 and infringement procedures, but we have neglected preventive side. So the problems uh, which came, for instance, in Poland in 2015, it was li like uh, something coming out of the blue and we were not able to, uh, we, we had only to react and we, we want to work proactively with the member states. That's why indeed now we have 27 reports about the situation in, in 27 states, uh, unique uh, constitutional systems, unique uh, solutions of checks and balances 
and unique uh, kinds of issues uh, that are more uh, bigger or smaller issues in, in all the member states. And it's the invitation for a dialogue. We, we want to speak to the representatives. Uh, you cannot see any recommendation in the report because this is a sensitive topic. It's not fiscal policy where we can uh, count <laughs> the public debt and then, then come with uh, some recommendation. This is uh, not um, measuring, this is assessing. Uh, and uh, dialogue is needed. Uh, and we uh, try to introduce the conditionality between the, the EU budget and, and EU money distributed to the member states and the respect uh, uh, of, 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 of the rule of law principle in each country. The negotiations, negotiations are now ongoing. So, so we want to enlarge the toolbox uh, we have uh, already now, and we, we want to do more in, on preventive side and also to, to condition the, the finance. On the second question and, and the, the digital sphere and, and Facebook, uh, I, I was uh, very patiently listening to Mr. Reinisch because he, I think, I kind of confirmed that we have uh, intensive cooperation. We are going to uh, de develop the set of rules for digital sphere. First of all, the Commission has to uh, make uh, absolutely clear insight what we want. I can already now share with you that we want the technology to work for the people. And we already showed it before with GDPR that uh, we wanted to bring back the, the rights uh, uh, of, of privacy to individual people. We didn't want to see the crowd, uh, which uh, is, is handled as crowd in digital space. So uh, we, we want to continue this uh, European approach. Definitely, uh, and I want to react on, on Chinese case, we do everything to limit the access to the data uh, also for the states, uh, the state control and surveillance, it's something we do not want to, to, uh, uh, to uh, go forward uh, to the extent which, which will be detrimental for, for the society. COVID came uh, as undesired lesson in the progress, uh, in, in our process towards the, the rules for digital. Two experiences, uh, the fight against disinformation in COVID. Uh, here I have to thank Facebook and other big tech because the cooperation is, is great. They, they are enabling uh, to, to, for, for full use uh, 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 their space for the authoritative uh, um, uh, opinions and, and information uh, for the health authorities. Uh, so that the people, when they go open the, the Facebook or Google or, and, and other systems, they see first the, the guaranteed information from the side of the health sector. Uh, and we, we had to act uh, against this information because it is what, what, what Mr. Krastev said, that we have a lot of anxiety and a lot of distrust. Uh, and we need the people now to trust the institutions and to come along with the advice which come from the from the official places we cannot get out of, of the, this crisis uh, otherwise and we uh, also um, want to uh, work on uh, uh, yeah, I, I forgot what I wanted to say. Yeah, uh, the, the populists that they are not gaining. Well, populists are, are perfect in delivering uh, popular decisions. To tame COVID uh, means to take a lot of unpopular decisions, but responsible decisions. So uh, the, the work against disinformation in COVID is, is important and I, I would say also successful and intensive. Uh, in EDAP, in the European Democracy Action Plan, we will have a chapter how to fight against disinformation, but it will be about a uh, broader picture. And I can, can already, already t uh, tell you now that we are not going to sacrifice the freedom of speech. We are not going to introduce any kind of censorship. Uh, we do not want to do what the bad actors want that they will spread this information and then we'll, we will sacrifice one of the basic values. It will not happen. The great experience was with tracing apps and with the technological tools to identify the, the, the 
the, the, the people uh, or to announce the people who met somebody infected. Uh, here, the union came immediately with the guidelines for the member states how to do the apps uh, 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 to be useful, but not to turn against uh, the people, not to go too far, uh, not to be too intrusive uh, uh, from the point of view of privacy protection. So uh, I think that in Europe we have healthy instincts also when it comes to technologies now in this very difficult uh, COVID, uh, COVID era. So I, I don't want to keep Thank all the time for myself, so I will Thank stop so here. Thank you very much. Vice President, you very courageously tackled two huge issues in such a short period of time. And I'll use this opportunity to ask whether there are questions in the audience at this point to the speakers. And we have a question over there. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dominika Haidu. I'm a research fellow here in the uh, Globsex Democracy and Resilience Program. And I have a question to Mr. Krastev, who mentioned the fact that um, um, actually people are uh, losing uh, trust in the governments and there is a huge need uh, for the people to trust their institutions and the governments in times of, of crisis like this one. So my question is how to rebuild people's trust in the institutions in, in, uh, uh, in the relations to, to each other. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I would actually love for uh, all the speakers to answer this question. And we have another question, so I'll take two at a time. Go ahead. Uh, please raise your hand if you have a question, because then we'll have to go back to the speakers. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Thibault Mizerg. I'm the Europe Program Director at the International Republican Institute. Uh, my question is a bit more generational, and uh, uh, one one thing that Ivan Krastev uh, has not talked about, although he wrote about it at the beginning of the pandemic, is uh, the question of young people. Uh, I think all the data that both IRI, NDI, and other organizations that are doing polling on democracy is showing that young people are more and more disappointed with democracy. They are more and more, uh, uh, they, they see more and more affinities towards uh, uh, non-democratic systems. And uh, my question is this, how do we react to that, considering that uh, we had a millennial generation that has been sacrificed uh, economically uh, after the 2008 uh, um, crisis? It looks like we have a zillennial generation, which is probably set to pay a very heavy price, at least in the short term, on the, of the, for the pandemic. So how do we bring these people back into the fold? Is it just economics? Or do you see something more uh, uh, cultural and uh, political that needs to, uh, political effort that needs to be uh, to be to be put there? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'll start with Ivan, but I also ask Chris and Marcus to address uh, the question as well. But Ivan, you go first, please. Um, very briefly, I'll try to address both issues. One is on building trust. And listen, I don't believe that there is a universal kind of advice you can give. But one of the important issues is the time to build trust in the moment of crisis. Exactly when people have a high stakes in the situation, you really can basically convince people to trust you. And from this point of view, the successes that we're talking about, be it the Danish government uh, or what uh, Chancellor Merkel did in Germany, was based on the fact that in the moment like this, you are not simply exploiting the trust which is already there, but you are creating trust. Uh, and we know this historically, this is like in a wartime. Because in the moment of crisis, crisis not trusting is a self-defeating kind of a policy. And I'm saying this because, listen, mistrust is its also important role in democracy. Uh, we're coming from the part of the world where in 60s and 70s, uh, our parents were very much kind of a taught how to trust the governments too much, and we knew how it uh, ended. So from this point of view, uh, I have also positive view on mistrust, but the governments should be able to basically ask people to trust them, also taking tough decisions. Uh, and from this point of view, I do believe crisis is an opportunity. Uh, and this is the moment you're doing this. 
Uh, and this is not by accident that, yes, we have a lot of misinformation, you have fake news and others. But when it comes to the personal health of the people, they're taking much more seriously the advice coming from, for example, medical experts than it was in the time of the economic crisis, where they don't have the feeling that it was so much personally connected to them. And then we go to the generational issue. And this is an important issue because um, I do believe that in a certain way also this crisis shows uh, important general, generational dynamics. Uh, the younger generations were less vulnerable. On the other side, economically, probably they're going to pay the price of this crisis. One of the reasons younger generations start to look for a kind of a non-democratic alternatives is that they understand politics as a much more fast moving animal. One of the biggest problems with the democratic politics is time and timing of decisions. Uh, and for these young generations, which basically was born with uh, their mobile phones, everything should happen immediately. Now, they don't have a patience for deliberations, they don't have patience for disagreement, they want something to happen immediately. And because for this generation, particularly, the climate change is a big issue. They have the feeling that the democratic leaders has a wrong understanding of time. In a certain way, in democracy, traditionally, one of the message was we should take our time. We should have the possibility to look at the issue from two, three, four different uh, perspectives. Uh, but the time is running much faster today than ever before. And this I see as the major challenge. And this is going to be also uh, the major way basically to regain the trust of the younger generation. You need a democratic decision making which is working faster. Thank you so much, Ivan. And that seems like a very logical point to go back to Marcus, because um, Chris was earlier talking about the need not just for the governments to step up to rebuild the trust and the social contract with the citizens, but also for the tech to step up. And uh, tech seems like to be a perfect candidate to increase the pace of uh, action in the democratic societies. So what is your vision about that? Well, I, I guess... Again, there's a, there's a multi-pronged approach to this one, and, and, and we play a role, as I said before. Um, I think one, one of the key contributions that we can make is how we deal with misinformation. And again, I just, you know, it, it, it's not a nice thing to say, but Facebook itself is not a trust business. But therefore, we and everybody else very much relies on a healthy and functioning media environment, uh, you know, not just in Europe, but, but across. So th this is clearly a contributor. And the way that we deal with this is that we bring in our fact-checking partners, which are basically the big publishers, media companies um, in, in, in Europe. So I think that, that plays a, an important role. I'm not speaking about the institutions. I'm not speaking about politicians. I think even have, has done this relatively well. But then there's one other area, I think, where we can sort of turbocharge the trust building. And, and that's something that we've learned specifically during COVID. And that is the role that we as platforms play when it comes to um, providing authoritative information. And I was talking before about uh, our COVID information center. You know, we, we had across the globe, we had 2 billion people that were exposed to these informations. And then we had about half a billion people across the world that actually then really access this information. Uh, about 50 million in, in, in Europe. So this, this is something where you can clearly build trust. And I'm not sure that COVID is sort of the last um, example where this happened. I think there's a role um, where we increasingly have to see other opportunities where authoritative information, uh, not just be not in health, be it also what I said about recovery, but other forms of authoritative information when it comes to the democratic dialogue, to the social cohesion, um, where we can uh, provide this on, on our platform. And, and maybe just to the last, or the second question on, on, on youth and how do we get young people back again? I think as a link to the first one, again, it's how do we reach people? And we talked about the negative side of, of social media platforms and of technology in, and, and, as I said, spread of misinformation of hate speech and so on. But there is clearly a positive side that we do reach more and more people and that we reach specifically young people, either with authoritative information, but also when it comes to other political information, when it comes to political advertisement. And actually, one thing which makes me a little bit less pessimistic is I do work with, with youth, youth organizations. And, and one thing that... that, that was apparent is that actually the participation in elections in Europe, specifically in the European Parliament election of under 25s, has gone up over time. 
and I don't think that is because purely because of social media, but it is that candidates can reach out in a much more appropriate way to that group of the population um, in, in a more uh, attractive and in a more appealing form. Thank you so much, Marcus. And I'm going to go to Chris with the same questions, but also with an additional twist, because we talked a lot about what the government needs to do, what tech platforms need to do. Uh, but uh, Madam State Secretary and Madam Vice President both mentioned that citizens themselves have a very active role to play. Chris, can you also mention what civil society can do to both rebuild trust and bring in the younger people? And thank you for the question. And, and I'll just build off uh, comments that were, were made uh, a moment ago. I think the changes have been so sweeping in the last uh, decade. I don't think anyone fores foresaw the way in which uh, technology would animate so much of our lives, whether it's politics, um, commercial lives, or otherwise. And we're still trying to catch up. Ivan Krostev mentioned how fast uh, the world is moving. This is true both in terms of political de decision making policy making, and we have a lot of work to do to make uh, sure that we can catch up. It's worth noting that today uh, it's impossible to talk about uh, how our media functions, how our elections function, or other critical institutions without talking about the um, indispensable role that technology is playing in that, either in the privacy surveillance case or in the censorship, free expression, integrity of information domain. And as we get into Internet of Things and advanced technologies with uh, deeper machine learning, this will become even more important. Having said all that, I think governments um, are trying in democratic settings to figure this out. And it's um, overwhelming at times for them to take decisions at a speed that can keep up with change. For those reasons, it's all the more important that civil society plays a role in educating both policymakers, but I would contend a wider society, because today it's it's really an enormous burden for any single um, citizen who's consuming over overwhelming amounts of information in this age to sort out what's true and what isn't, what sources are authentic and what aren't, uh, in the absence of the the rules and norms that we don't yet have in a in a significant enough way. Uh, to help govern uh, this kind of information in our societies. And so I would contend it's as important as anything uh, to have civil society that can help educate, animate, uh, otherwise bring to the attention problems that are there. And I've just gotten finished reading a book authored by Ron Debert at the University of Toronto, who describes uh, the challenges we face in the internet uh, integrity fear. And he makes the case that Dividing the world in the internet freedom realm is not, it's not sufficient to divide this into autocracies and democracies. This is apropos part of uh, earlier in the discussion. But to think about authoritarian practices that have started to emerge from our digital space and now that have um, uh, led into the uh, open space as well. And I think civil society has to play a role in both educating wider society, identifying problems and helping to correct them uh, and do this in a way that can actually accelerate our response to them. I think the experience of the last decade or so suggests that we need to accelerate things even more in this regard. Um, in the absence of that, I fear we're going to, um, to lose ground and we, are, we can't afford to do that. Final comment, just uh, one overarching comment. I would say that, you know, today, there may be um, a tendency to despair when we talk about democracy, and it's admittedly a very challenging time. But I think it's precisely the time to support democracy more vigorously. We can't just support it when the going is good. And now the going's tougher, but I think all of us have to find more creative, forward-looking ways to support the sort of norms and institutions that can bring better outcomes. Thank you so much, Chris. We have no intention whatsoever to succumb to despair. But what I'm afraid we have to succumb to is the pressure of time. We have uh, 60 seconds to wrap up, but I'll use the 60 seconds to give each of you uh, 10 of them and uh, give what you think should be the main takeaway from the discussion today for the audience, literally in 10 seconds. Ivan, you will go first. I take away that I'm going to come to the next Global Sec tool. Perfect. I like that one. Thank you so much. Marcus? I'd like to come to you and I really wish for strong 
um, frameworks that deal with the challenges of our society and of technology. And I'm looking forward to working together with Europe, with Vice President Jourova, and with many other stakeholders. Thank you so much. Chris? My main takeaway is that the, the discussion we've had today, I think, is a reflection of how seriously the big issues are being engaged today and how we're starting to mobilize and make headway in a positive manner. Thank you so much. Uh, Madam Vice President? Yes, I think that it was a positive debate, uh, which, uh, however, uh, uh, brought uh, some uh, stronger uh, alert. Let's work together and let's not neglect the, the, the issues uh, uh, stemming from uh, backsliding of, of, of this de de democracy and, and the rule of law. And we have a chance, and uh, speaking about the digital uh, global uh, problems require global solutions, which will have positive local effect. And here I see a very good chance for co cooperation over the Atlantic also. Thank you so much. And going across the Atlantic, Madam State Secretary, you have the last word. Well, I'm also very happy to be a part of Globosec and hope you invite me again. But I think it shows it is important to exchange honest opinions and really pick apart what is going on and look for solutions together. Democracies need to cooperate and understand what the issues are. And we need to deal with the challenges that are there in the 21st century, which are different from the ones that hobbled us in the 20th century, but require cooperation and truth uh, and really telling it like it is, which I think we have done today. And thank you very much, Elena, for your help in all of this. Thank you so much, Madam State Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, uh, distinguished speakers and all the audience members. Please take it as an official invitation to our next uh, Globsec Forum, which is going to be in June, or to our other discussions that are going to happen, either virtually as we have it now or in person. Uh, thank you for that. And with that, I have to conclude this session. But please, people who are in the audience, stay in the room, because on the screen we're going to see the Con uh, the closing remarks uh, made by the president of Globsec, Robert Vash, that are going to be broadcast from another session. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.